Right. Good afternoon, everyone. So, as you gather from that, I'm the man who's standing between you and the free pizza. So I'll try not to run over too much. Uh, so my name is Bruce Merry. I work at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, particularly on the Meerkat Radio Telescope. And I'm going to be talking about something a bit different today. I'm not going to mention microservices or serverless or event-drivenness or CI, CD, that. I'm going to be talking about something we kind of take for granted, which is how the data actually moves between all these services. So Meerkat's a radio telescope we've built out in the crew. It's currently operating. We're still improving it. Uh, it's currently a project to build an extra 20 dishes to expand its capacity, and eventually it'll be incorporated into the square kilometer array, which will be an even more powerful radio telescope. But I'm not going to say too much about it. Um, a colleague of mine gave a talk about it last year, so if you're interested in more about the telescope in general, go look on YouTube. I think the talk is there. Uh, those dishes you saw are just the tip of the iceberg, so they're kind of over on the left there. Uh, there's a whole lot of data processing we do. So I actually work in the science data processor team. I'm not going to go through all the details on there. This is just a slide I had which showed the kind of, that there's lots of stuff going on. Uh, but I'm also going to be talking a lot about this core switch in the correlator beamformer side of things, which is a different team. Uh, that's a lot of FPGAs, a lot of very high bandwidth things happening. So, uh, people often ask me at these talks, well, how, what is the sort of data you get in Meerkat? Well, it depends where you measure it as you go sort of left to right on that previous diagram. So the rawest of raw data, which is just voltage signals out of each dish, looking at 2.2 terabits a second. So I did a quick calculation when I uh, saw a presentation earlier from Facebook. They said that 2.7 billion users. So if every single one of those users was generating about 100 bytes a second, that's about what we'd be dealing with just in this single scientific instrument. Uh, sort of in that sort of left middle block we had, which was the correlator, sort of internal to that, it's moving data around slightly less, slightly lower rate, two terabits a second. Uh, that's basically a giant data reduction machine, so by the time data's coming out of that, it's only a mere 70 gigabits a second. You know, drop in the ocean. And we process a bit more in the science data processor, and we average it down a bit more. And by the time we actually put stuff on disk, we've got a maximum of about 5.4 gigabits a second. So maximum, that's if we're using sort of all the highest data rate modes all at the same time. We're not actually doing that yet. Even when we do it, we probably won't do it all the time, but it equates to about 60 terabytes a day. Uh, so yeah, that should be per day there, sorry. So it's quite a lot of data. But it's also fairly simple data. It's just these big multi-dimensional arrays of complex numbers. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have complex structure to it. Uh, so that means we need a lot of networking. So that core switch I pointed out is a 40 gigabit switching system. And we haven't actually populated all of these, but these are the sort of allocations we have for different things. So the antennas themselves, there's 64 antennas, so that's 64 network ports. Uh, scarabs are the FPGAs that do this very high-speed data processing. Science data processor, we don't actually have that many because that's where we've already reduced the data a lot. There's user-supplied equipments, an interesting thing. That means other projects uh, come and bring in their own servers and connect it into our network and consume our data. So one of those, for example, is Breakthrough Listen, which you probably know better as SETI. They, a lot of that user-supplied equipment is for that. We've got a few spare. So you can see this is quite a big network, and you're probably wondering what sort of switch has 684 ports on it. Well, so how do we build this? Well, one option is you can just have a tree of switches. And you've got a sort of a big switch at the top, and then you hang smaller switches off that, and eventually you hang some clients off at the bottom. That's fine for something like an office network, where you know, each client is not going to be communicating at its full rate very often. Or maybe if you have most of your communications happen within these small little networks, and you don't really put too much pressure on these sort of high-level links, it's not going to cut it for us. Uh, one of the sort of primary operations that happens in the network for this correlator is a kind of a data transpose. So on every antenna, we kind of put the signal basically into a Fourier transform that splits it up into uh, different frequency bands. Uh, 32,000 of them. So each of these F engines holds data for one antenna for all frequencies. But to do the correlation, what we actually need is for a few frequencies for every antenna, 
we have to process that data. So this thing in the middle is kind of all of these things on the left send to all of those things on the right, all getting fairly close to the data rate of these 40 gigabit links. Well, actually, it's split up into multiple 10 gigabit links, but it's that kind of thing. So that's not going to work with that kind of tree switch because everything's talking to everything else all the time, and you're going to completely overload those high-level links. So another option, could we just buy a very big switch? That's an, an Arista switch there. Uh, Cisco will sell you something similar. Uh, I have trouble with the perspective on this picture. I keep visualizing it as like a tower desktop. Uh, that's actually a 29 rack units and, you know, full rack width wide. Uh, draws 22 kilowatts. Uh, that's not going to fly. Our budget per rack is something like 10 kilowatts. And, you know, it still doesn't quite get to our 648 ports that we wanted. The other problem is I have one desktop at home and the cables are a mess. Can you imagine running 576 cables into one rack? It will be a complete, utter disaster. So there's another option. This is a type of network invented by a guy called Charles Klo in, in like 60s or 70s, for actually invented for telephone networks, where you have sort of small, uh, lots of little switches that you connect together in this sort of fairly dense network. So you have sort of signals coming in at the left into one of these little switches. It then picks a route somewhere into the middle layer, and then it comes out to wherever on the right-hand layer you need to get to. Uh, the way we tend to draw this, it's called a folded floor network, but it's just basically a different way of drawing it. So you've got these what we call spine switches at the top and leaf switches at the bottom. So now instead of that tree view where you just had one switch at the top, you've now got multiple paths between uh, all of these leaf switches. So that means that you've now got enough bandwidth for every client to send data at the full possible data rate all the time. Uh, so that's some of these switches. So these are the 64 links coming in from the actual antennas. Uh, you can see that uses half of each of these switches. We have a lot of fiber cables. Apparently this is about a third of the cost of the entire switching solution is just all these fiber cables, uh, mainly because the transceivers on each end are somewhat pricey, you know, apparently come down, but it's still you know, millions of rands. Right, so that's how the switch is actually built. What do we run on top of this network? So in Meerkat, we use multicast for everything. If you haven't come across multicast, it's kind of a publish subscribe type thing, but at the network layer. So you know, a particular uh, dish can send out its data, and multiple systems can subscribe to that data. And the switches themselves will um, distribute the data. So you can see here we've got a single sender. We can send it to several receivers. This has some nice advantages. As I say, you can have multiple consumers for a particular stream of data without having to actually replicate the data in the network, uh, you know, from the clients. Um, so we've got two different types of things we can do with this data, and we can run them both at the same time with different processing. Um, another example of this is search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, you'll have people doing their actual you know, imaging of pulsars or quasars or whatever the hell it is they're looking at. But uh, the people from SETI can just plug into all of that data. Whatever we happen to be looking at, they'll take a copy and see if they can find any techno signals in that. It's also great for debugging, because if something is going wrong with one of these data streams, you just add another subscriber, you plug it into some sort of data capture or some sort of protocol analyzer, and without disturbing what's actually happening in the system, you can see a copy of any of these individual data streams. And the other handy thing is we don't have to do any kind of fancy service discovery thing, because multicast is already a kind of service discovery. You say. I want to listen to this particular multicast group, and somewhere someone is going to send data to that multicast group. The sender and the receiver don't need to know about each other. They just need to know the IP address of that multicast group, and the switch takes care of it. Um, it's not all roses, so it's basically something you can do with UDP, uh, which is a, obviously a, loss, a lossy uh, transmission. Uh, you can't really do it so much with something like TCP. That's fine for us because it's a real-time system. 
If you lose a packet, you can't you know, wait for the physical system sending you photons to just hold on a minute and stop sending you photons <laughs> while we retransmit things. The photons keep arriving. So if a packet gets lost, it gets lost. Obviously, we try and minimize packet loss, but we can tolerate a little bit of packet loss. One thing in radio astronomy, most of the data is noise. So if we lose a little bit of noise, you know, it's all right. We collect a lot of data and average it down together to get rid of the noise. Um, the other thing is, if you go shop and buy a switch and plug it into your network, it's probably not going to be optimized for multicast. It might not even work for multicast. You could enable some queries and some IGMP snooping and other things. And with one of these big uh, clone networks, which is big and complicated, it's really not trivial to set that up. And by not trivial, I mean we got several switch vendors in when we were considering doing the tender, and none of them could set it up right to make it actually achieve what we wanted to achieve with everything sending full data rate all the time. And we had to sort of work with the, several of the switch vendors to actually get something that would work for us. Uh, so here's... Another problem we have is with load balancing. So here's that sort of picture again where you've got uh, the left and right of these sort of leaves and the middle is the spine. So let's say that we've set up circuits for A, B, C, and D, which are those four different colored lines you see there. Uh, it's a little difficult to see, but if you want now E on the left, uh, let's see where's the laser, yeah, so E on the left, to talk to E on the right, there's no free circuit that will go all the way through if all of those links that, you've, that we've already drawn in are already saturating those links. So one of the options is, uh, this is known as a reconfigurably non-blocking switch, which means that you could fix this by redirecting one of those existing flows through another alternative path, and that would free up something. Uh, it's a bit tricky to do, to try and do a top-down control of your network to reconfigure some flow that's already flowing and make sure you're not duplicating or losing things as you reconfigure it. Um, yeah, so what we do instead is instead of sending each flow over just one route, we actually distribute it across all those middle layer nodes. And we can do that just by distributing the traffic across multiple IP addresses or multicast groups. And usually this is multidimensional data anyway. There's usually some sort of frequency axis. So we just kind of split up the data into smaller chunks of frequency and split it across lots of multicast groups. And that also has side benefits, means if you only want to, if you only care about some of those frequencies, you only have to subscribe to some of those multicast groups. You don't have to subscribe to the entire fire hose. Um, the other thing is there's RFCs for how you actually steer those multicast groups. Um, basically, every multicast group is assigned to a rendezvous point, which is one of those middle layer switches. And the RFC gives some sort of hashing algorithm which says, based on the IP address, which of those switches should it go to. And that gives sort of more or less balanced, because it's randomized, but it's not going to be perfectly balanced. You're going to have some that will end up with more data and some that will end up with less data. So we actually got the switch vendor to customize the steering for that, and we just do round robin. And that way, as long as we use contiguous multicast addresses, we'll get perfect load balancing across all those switches, which we need because we push some of these links at over 90% of their capacity. Um, there are some other problems we run into, which we discovered once we'd built this big system and we're trying to push lots of data through it, is switches are not magic. They have buffers in them. And what we would find is uh, some of our processes were kind of funnel in. So we had multiple senders all producing relatively low data rates, and then we'd have one receiver listening to all of those senders. And if the packets are sort of nicely timed so they don't collide, that all works great. If all of those senders happen to decide to send a packet all at the same time, that will all flow up into one switch somewhere and sit in one buffer. And these particular switches we bought are, not, you know, they're probably five years old or so now. It's an older generation. And they have a buffer for each port on the switch, which is quite small. So the newer switches will have one big buffer, and they can dynamically hold packets from whichever switch. Uh, but these ones have a small buffer per port. 
And interestingly, it's actually buffered on the incoming side, at least for multicast. So what will happen is here, as this data arrives down here, it will get buffered there. And we'd find that sometimes all of those senders would send a packet at the same time. And even though the overall data rate was low, they'd all hit this buffer and overflow it. What makes it worse is these senders are FPGAs, so they have very predictable timing. And they were driven by packets coming in from these digitizers. And because timing is very important in radio astronomy, those are all synchronized to a, uh, an atomic clock from a hydrogen maser. So we had a system which was designed to synchronize all these packet sending very tightly. So it actually made things as bad as could possibly be. So we had to introduce uh, some deliberate delays into each of these FPGAs so that each one would have a different delay so that these packets would all uh, zipper together nicely instead of all coming in a single shot. Uh, the other thing that can happen with this multicast is if you've misconfigured one of your receivers and it's actually subscribing to too much data, so that sort of pinkish one there, if it's subscribed to two, say, 30 gigabit streams over a 40 gigabit network, it's obviously going to lose packets. But the problem is that uh, because the packets are buffered on the ingress side of things, that means that not only does that receiver lose packets, but the anyone else who's receiving data from one of those streams might lose packets as well. So that red receiver listening to the red stream might also start seeing packet loss. So that means we actually have to be fairly careful about controlling what happens on our network, making sure that people don't misbehave and start subscribing to more data than they can actually handle. Because it doesn't just affect them, it actually affects other users on the system. Um, so then the question is, how do you monitor all this? If you think someone's maybe oversubscribed one of the links, you've got to go and sort of find out who it is, you know, where it is, tell them to stop. So we started off just using, I think this is a commercial product called Observium, which is, just uses SNMP, and you can tell it where all your switches are, it can scrape them. And it gives you a lot of information, but it's not very good at giving you a high-level view. So you can kind of go, okay, I want to see this particular port on this particular switch. And it can then show you a graph of what's happened over the last hour, week, day, month, whatever. But if you just know some data is going missing somewhere, you, you don't know which port it is, you don't even know which switch it is, we found Observium wasn't actually very good for doing that. So we built something ourselves. So you won't be able to read this, don't worry, but you can see each of those little blobs there is a data rate. So you've got the leaf switches down the side. Across the top, you've got all the spine switches. And then these are the sort of middle layer links between the leaf switches and the spine switches. And every cell in that grid is one of those Ethernet links. And it's showing you the data rate across that. We've got a similar version of this, which uh, shows you number of packets discarded. And this is a, a nasty, hacky thing, which just actually SSHs into the management interface on each of the switches, sort of issues, you know, switch commands to say, please print out the stats for, this, for all the ports, and then parses it, and prints it like this. Uh, the newest switches have sort of JSON REST type interfaces, but these older switches didn't implement it. Incidentally, this is a bit of open source software. You can see there's an Earl on the bottom. You probably have to go in and change all the hard-coded addresses of the switches and things. Um, but that, that was great for seeing what's going on right now. So if you can see something's going wrong at the moment, you can look at that and kind of isolate it. But it wasn't really good for uh, post-mortem. So if you find out that something went wrong with the observation you took in the middle of the night, you want to say, well, was it something happening in the switches? Wasn't so good. So I built a sort of a further version of this, which again SSHs into all the switches and scrapes stuff from them. But it's driven by Prometheus, which is a monitoring system. So every, I think it's 16 seconds or something, it'll do this, stores the data in Prometheus, and then we have some dashboards here. So the two well, the four on the left are data rates, either from clients to leaves or leaves to spines. And then the ones on the right are showing drop packets. So you can see we do drop some packets now and then. It tends to drop a fair amount as you start up an observation. 
because suddenly the switch has to figure out all this multicast routing, and then it settles down once you reach a steady state. But when things go wrong, you can see packets will be continuously dropped, and then you can start investigating. Again, that's open source. It's a bit more configurable. You can probably just uh, plug it into your Prometheus config. And this is just another view from another in Grafana, scraping the same Prometheus data, just looking at every indiv at individual switches and the clients and the data rates from them. The other thing is we use something called LLDP, Linked Layer Discovery Protocol, which uh, just lets clients advertise their name to the switch. And the scraper for Prometheus also goes and scrapes that information out. So it's instead of just seeing it's, you know, switch L17 port three, you actually get a name for the system and then, you know, whoever's responsible for that system, you can go whack on the head and tell them to uh, stop o o spamming the network. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the switch side of things. I'm now gonna talk about what we actually do on the hosts to deal with this data. As I said, the really high bandwidth stuff is mostly done on these FPGAs, but we do funnel a lot of this data into hosts still at fairly high speed. So, yeah, how do we do 40 gigabits? I'll be honest, actually we don't quite do 40, we run it a bit less, but it's still fairly high bandwidth. And the trick is you not only want to receive at this average rate, but you ideally don't want to be dropping ideally any packets, but preferably not too many packets. So I went, so I did a lot of optimization over the last few years, and for this talk I basically went back and put a machine back to kind of the unoptimized state, more or less where we would have started for this, and ran a benchmark for our uh, high-speed packet receiver, managed 6.3 gigabits a second. Yeah, not so good. Uh, so one of the problems is power management. Um, I am unfortunately responsible for some of global warming because uh, <laughs> power management is not your friend when you want to drop no packets because power management is all based on put the computer to sleep and when the data rate starts picking up, uh, sort of wake up and start doing something. And if you have that sinusoidal traffic pattern that Carla was showing that Facebook has, that's great because you gradually climb up the sinusoid. Our traffic pattern is a box function. We turn the telescope on, the fire hose opens, data flows, and then at some point we decide, right, we're done collecting data for this experiment, we turn off the tap, we drop off the other end of the box function. That's not so good for power management. So turn off your dynamic frequency scaling, you get a little bit more, you went from 6.3 to 6.6, these things called C states, which is another way the processor goes to sleep. Uh, we restrict it to C1, which still allows a little bit of sleep, but not too much. You can go up to 10.4. This is sort of fully sustainable data rate. I think we can go faster if we prepare to drop packets, but this is, we can do this rate and not drop packets as we go. Um, this isn't so much power management thing, it's more kind of latency bandwidth tuning thing that uh, the network interface card has where it can turn down the rate of interrupts if it thinks you don't need to be no right now. Uh, turn that off helps a bit. Uh, one of the nice things is we're not latency sensitive, we're just bandwidth sensitive. Um, fortunately, this hasn't been a problem for us because our hardware, we're running in production, is too old to have ABX 512. But Cloudflare actually posted an interesting blog a little while ago where they'd found that having Crypto routines that used AVX 512 actually slowed down their systems because AVX 512 draws so much power that the Intel CPUs will actually clock down if you start using AVX 512 instructions to not burn out. And then everything is affected by that clock down, not just the little bit of code you ran that used AVX 512. So, where do we get to? Um, the next thing you find is that Linux for I don't know where this number comes from, but if you have a socket, by default, it has a buffer for packets in the socket of 212992 bytes. I have no idea how they came off that number. But if you divide it by 40 gigabits a second, you find that that's a five microsecond buffer. That's nothing, you know, a kernel, kernel function call can take five microseconds. So if you want to be able to process the buffer before it overflows, use a bigger buffer. So there's some system control commands you can use to change both the default and the max buffer size. Uh, let's see what happens. If we crank that up to eight megabytes, you suddenly be looking at 19 gigabits a second instead of, I think we were about 11 or something before. Where were we? 11.6. Uh, you can make it bigger as well. You know, there's almost no limit. Uh, 
Ideally, though, if you make it too big, it doesn't fit in your L3 cache anymore. And then your performance can actually drop just by making your buffer bigger. So you're really caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, the other thing, it, when I tried to redo this experiment for this talk, I found IP tables didn't really make any difference. But back when I started doing all this tuning, I found IP tables, just having it loaded, even with no rules, can slow down your processing, mostly because of a particular module called NF Contract, which tries to do kind of stateful connection tracking. So you found if you take that out, your performance goes up. Bit of a problem because Docker, we use Docker for everything, it uses IP tables for its um, container networking. If you can turn that off, you can run Docker just with host networking. Uh, fortunately, we found a better way to do things, so we never actually went down this road. But it's something to keep in mind if you're trying to do high-speed networking. Uh, another thing you have to watch out for, I'm probably, sorry, this is a bit of an eye test, um, but basically if you have a CPU, well, a server with multiple CPUs in it, and I mean multiple sockets, not just multiple cores, then, you run, then you'll probably be familiar with the term non-uniform memory access. Basically that means that everything in the system is connected to one of those sockets or the other, so you've got uh, some network cards here, a graphics card there, um, some another network card there, you know, your cores here, some memory up there, some memory up there. So if you're receiving data on a network card that's over there, storing it in memory over there and processing it over there, the data's got to move between the two sides there. And unfortunately, it happens between base, some, a bus, which is basically two tin cans and a piece of string. <laughs> it's gotten a little, suddenly QPI was a bit like that. UPI looks a little better, but it's still something you really want to avoid. And unfortunately, a lot of the, suddenly back when we started doing this, the orchestration frameworks were not really aware of this, and they just put things wherever. So we've actually written our own scheduler. I gave a talk about two or three years ago here, our own scheduler, which is numer aware and make sure it places things. So interrupt driven, we tend to use it interrupt driven because there's normally more work we want the CPU to do when it's not receiving data. Uh, for Mellanox cards at least, Mellanox provide a library which uh, you just load into your application and makes it look like you're just using normal sockets. Uh, we're not actually using that because there's still some overheads in there. Main problem I found is the documentation, the documentation for Infiniman verbs is reasonable. Using it for raw Ethernet is poor. Uh, the kind of extensions we're using to speed it up further is practically non-existent. So that, that's the hard part, is just finding out how to make this thing work. Once it works, it works quite nicely. We also found some surprising limitations in a couple of the network cards. Uh, the one is, I mentioned there's this hardware flow steering, so there's a table in the network card. Uh, the first network cards we were using was Connect X3, which is a 40 gigabit NIC, and it has a cache for this flow steering table. So when packets comes in, it sort of tries to look up, what do I do with this packet? And we found that once we had more than a certain number of multicast groups, the performance just fell on the floor. And I think even the Menlock support people didn't realize there was this cache, we could see it was there because we've added more multicast groups and suddenly the performance tanked. So at that point we upgraded to Connect X5, which is actually a 100 gigabit NIC, and that solved that problem. Um, the other problem you find is, because we're using multicast, we're not sending a lot of multicast. Most of the sending is happening from the FPGAs, but for simulators we send from multicast. And these network cards actually have a nice feature where they'll take the multicast data you send, and if there's another on the red path, you send multicast data at a raw level, it'll loop it back into the network card in case you have another receiver on the same machine which wants that multicast data. But the, that switch inside the NIC can only handle a certain amount of bandwidth. So if you want to try and send at full data rate and receive at full data rate, it actually won't do it. And you have to turn off that loopback function. Okay, so that brings me basically to the end. Um, things you might look at the future is moving data directly from the network card into a GPU without going through system memory. That should avoid a lot of drop packets and improve bandwidth. The problem is you have to pay NVIDIA a lot of money for a Tesla if you want to do that. We're mostly using the G-forces, which are a lot cheaper, but don't support it. Similar sort of thing is you can tell a remote system, please go and write this data into some memory there without involving the host CPU on the other side. Again, saves a lot of CPU power. 
And we're also going to go looking at software-defined networking sort of in place of this multicast. And as someone said earlier, it's not a scale conf talk unless you have the obligatory XKCD cartoon. So please enjoy that and then ask me questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So this looks like years of finding very, very obscure problems. I'm guessing you didn't just Google my network card is slow. How do you find <laughs> stuff like this? Okay. How do you find these uh, solutions to these problems? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, some of it does take time, so, and some of it we've done with support from the vendors. So, as I said, we've got Mellanox switch, Mellanox network cards, um, and a support contract with them. So, you know, we've had them actually, you know, remote logging into our switches to debug them. Uh, some of the network cards, um, you know, some of the performance stuff, you know, there's profiling tools for Linux that'll show you, you know, 90% of your CPU time is being spent in this kernel function. You think, well, maybe we should get the kernel out of the way, or uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, it is. It has taken us a long time. Uh, cool. Down the front here, uh, Bruce. What are you, who are your FPGA vendors um, from before, and what, where are you looking for in the future? Um, so I think we're using Xilinx Vertex 7s and those FPGA, FPGAs at the moment. We're looking at a whole bunch of options uh, for our sort of next generation. I'm trying to persuade uh, that the team to look a lot more closely at GPUs. Uh, so maybe even get rid of FPGAs entirely, maybe just use FPGAs to handle just the networking and leave the processing to GPUs where it's a lot easier to develop it. If you don't know FPGAs, uh, you know, it's low power, but the main thing is compile times are through the roof. So if they make a change to the design, they say, come back tomorrow when hopefully it'll have finished compiling by then. So that makes it extremely difficult to develop. Uh, we're also looking at now, these were sort of standalone boxes with FPGAs in them, you know, without a regular CPU. We're looking at I think all the vendors really uh, at PCI plug-in cards, possibly in a converged system with sort of an FPGA and a GPU and several other things in it. Anyone else? Yep. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, when you do drop packets, do you just not care? Um, like yeah. Basically, you can't retry, right? There's no time. No, we, we don't retry. Um, yeah, basically, we flag the data as missing, and then everything which processes data has to be aware, you know, has to look at flags. And there's other reasons we might flag data. There might be, you know, a dish might have broken down, or um, there might be a satellite that's gone into the path and uh, flooded the thing with radio frequency interference. So we throw away huge amounts of data just because of radio frequency interference. So throwing away a little bit of data just because we drop some packets, you know, it's not really a big change to the architecture. Hi. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is around, uh, are you also looking at ARM-based uh, processors that are integrating both, let's say, CPU functionality and some... Uh, What-based processors? ARM. ARM-based? Yeah. No. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, we did spend a bit of time... Uh, working on with uh, NVIDIA's Jetson platform, because uh, one of our ideas was to make a, a sort of ruggedized system where instead of having taking up space in our actual data center building, we would uh, just take a bunch of um, small little Jetson boards, uh, stick them in oil, and oil cool them, and just stick them outside. Uh, that's still a kind of research project. Uh, it does look quite interesting, just in, gives us a different point on the sort of mix of bandwidth to processing power to, you know, um, energy consumption. So it's something we, we have considered. We're not doing anything with right at the moment. Okay. Uh, the other one was uh, in 
uh, if you use Prometheus a lot, have you encountered any things you can share around scaling and if you're using Thanos? Uh, to, to yeah, not really. We're not sticking that much data into Prometheus, so it's literally just running on one machine. That same machine is also running Grafana and Elastic Stack and Cabana and probably one of, and our sort of master controller. So, you know, that that's, hasn't been a pain point for us yet. Um, this is probably a stupid question, but um, do you have any garbage collection in your system, and have you looked at the effect of garbage collection on missing packets? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, we do use Python for basically everything. So there, have, there are some places where we have to make sure we explicitly delete objects so that they get cleaned up in a predictable way. The nice thing about Python is it has garbage collection, but also the C Python if you make sure you drop all the references to something, it is deleted immediately. It doesn't hang around until the garbage collector runs. And then the kind of actual high performance receive code is all C++. So that doesn't have to worry about garbage collection. And that runs on a separate thread, so it's not really affected too much by what the Python thread might be doing with garbage collection. Um, excuse my ignorance on multicast protocols, but assuming you've got such a complex um, switch mesh, are there not a lot of collisions? What sort of STP protocols would you use? Um, yeah, how does that work out? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by collisions? Um, you know, like loopbacks within the switches themselves. STPs, RSTPs, MSTPs, uh, sorry, I don't know spanning what tree are. protocols. Oh, span um, yeah, so we are using, what is it called, span uh, OSPF, I think is used to figure out the routing in the switch. Uh, but yeah, it, it, the routing is um, not predictable, uh, deterministic. Um, yeah, so I'm not a network expert either. I'm, I'm sort of relaying what I've found out from our team that actually deals with this switch. Okay, um, how has Starlink uh, affected uh, the satellite or their telescope? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, how has the Starlink uh, satellites affected the telescope? Uh, the satellites, um, yeah, so as I say, particularly in the L band, which is kind of 800 megahertz to about 1.6 gigahertz, we throw away about a quarter of that data without even looking at it. And that's a mix of uh, GPS, um, cell phone frequencies, a few other things. So yeah, it, it is a huge problem. Hi, um, this is a bit more away from the technology part, but I do think it's important. I just wanna know what is your men to women ratio on your dev team and where do you see it going? Um, so I I'd have to start counting on my fingers for... Uh, it's, no, no, it's, I just mean like yeah. rough estimate. More yeah, women than uh, men, one, more men than women. It's more men than women, but it's, I'd say it's a better ratio than I'm seeing in this room. 